will be two minutes of debate equally divided prior to a vote on the passage of the bill before us. Madam President. Madam President. Uh, the Senator from South Dakota. I urge all senators to support final passage of the Export Import Bank Reauthorization Act. Passing this bill today will make sure that the American exporters will not be put at a disadvantage to their foreign competitors, that nearly 300,000 American jobs will not be put at risk, and that the XM Bank will continue to return hundreds of millions of dollars to the Treasury. I want to thank many of my colleagues for their leadership on this issue, including Ranking Member Shelby, Senator Warner, Senator Cantwell, and Majority Leader, Leader Reid. I would also like to take this opportunity to recognize my staff for their hard work and important contributions to building bipartisan support for the reauthorization of the XM Bank. In particular, I want to say a special thanks to Patrick Grant, Conan McGuinness, Adam Healy, Lev Bargaman, and Charles B., who did exceptional work in the Bacon Committee to help us get to this point today. I'm also pleased that this bill, which passed out of the Banking Committee with unanimous bipartisan support, served as a framework for the House bill before us today. Once again, I strongly urge a yes vote on this important judge legislation. I yield the floor. Is there further debate? If not, the clerk will read the bill for the third time. Calendar number 396, H.R. 2072, an act to reauthorize the Export-Import Bank of the United States and for other purposes. The question is on the passage of the bill. Is there a sufficient second? There is. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bingaman, Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Blunt. Mr. 
Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown of Massachusetts. Mr. Brown of Ohio, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Coates, Mr. Coburn, Mr. Cochran, Ms. Collins, Mr. Conrad, Mr. Coons, Mr. Corker, Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Dement, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Inzi, Mrs. Feinstein, Mr. Franken, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mrs. Hagen, Mr. Harkin, Mr. Hatch, uh, I... Mr. Heller, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hutchison, Mr. Inhoff, Mr. Inoue, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johans, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota. Mr. Carey, Mr. Kirk, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Cole, Mr. Kyle, Ms. Landrew, Mr. Lautenberg, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Levin, Mr. Lieberman, Mr. Luger, Mr. Manchin, Mr. McCain, Mrs. McCaskill, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Ms. Mikulski, Mr. Moran, Ms. Murkowski, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Nelson of Florida, Mr. Nelson of Nebraska, Mr. Paul, Mr. Portman, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, Mr. Reed of Nevada, Mr. Risch, Mr. Roberts, Mr. Rockefeller, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Sessions, Mr. Shaheen, Mr. Shelby, Ms. Snow, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Toomey, Mr. Udall of Colorado, Mr. Udall of New Mexico, Mr. Vitter, Mr. Warner, Mr. Webb, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden.
Senators voting in the affirmative, Akaka, Alexander, Ayat, Baucus, Begich, Bingaman, Blumenthal, Blunt, Bozeman, Boxer, Brown of Massachusetts, Brown of Ohio, Burr, Cantwell, Carper, Casey, Chambliss, Coates, Coburn, Cochran, Collins, Conrad, Durbin, Feinstein, Franken, Graham, Hagen, Harkin, Heller, Hovind, Hutchison, Inouye, Isaacson, Johans, Johnson of South Dakota, Carey, Klobuchar, Cole, Landrew, Leahy, Lieberman, Luger, Manchin, McCaskill, Menendez, Merkley, Mikulski, Murkowski, Murray, Nelson of Nebraska, Nelson of Florida, Portman, Pryor, Reed of Rhode Island, Reed of Nevada, Schumer, Shaheen, Shelby, Snow, Tester, Udall of New Mexico, Warner, Webb, Whitehouse, Wicker, and Wyden, Mr. Thune. Mr. Thune, aye. Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Levin, Mr. Levin, aye. Mr. Lautenberg, Mr. Lautenberg, aye. Ms. Stabenow, Ms. Stabenow, aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, Mrs. Gillibrand, aye. Senators voting in the negative. Corker, Cornyn, Crapo, Dement, Hatch, Inhofe, Johnson of Wisconsin, Lee, McCain, Paul, Risch, Roberts, Rubio, Sanders, Toomey, and Vitter. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Cardin, aye. Mr. McConnell. Mr. McConnell, no. Coons. Mr. Coons, aye. Mr. Barrasso, no. Mr. Enzi, Mr. Enzi, no. Mr. Kyle, Mr. Kyle, no. Beautiful of Colorado, aye. Mr. Grassley, no. Mr. Sessions, aye.
Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye.
Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Aye. The yeas are 78, the nays are 20. The 60 vote threshold having been achieved, the bill is passed. Madam President. The Majority Leader. I move now to proceed to count number 365. The Clerk will report the motion. Senator from Nevada, Mr. Reed, moves to proceed to count number 365 as 2343, a bill to amend the Higher Education Act of 1965 and so forth and for other purposes. Ms. President, Madam President, I'm sorry. I move to proceed to executive session to consider count number 646, Jeremy Stein of Massachusetts to be a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Without objection, the clerk will report the nomination. Senator from Nevada, Mr. Reed moves to proceed to counter number 646, Jeremy C. Stein of Massachusetts to be a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Okay. Ms. Pre Ma Ms. Madam President, I sent a cloture motion to the desk with respect to the Stein nomination. The clerk will report the motion. Cloture motion. We, the undersigned senators, in accordance with the provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, hereby move to bring to a close the debate on the nomination of Jeremy C. Stein of Massachusetts to be a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, signed by 18 senators as follows. Reed, Leahy, Bingaman, Coons, Levin, Wyden, Nelson of Nebraska, Lieberman, Shaheen, Blumenthal, Carey, Gillibrand, Boxer, Feinstein, Whitehouse, Merkley, Rockefeller, and Johnson of South Dakota. I now move to proceed to legislative session. Without, without objection. The, the Senate resumes legislative se session. I now move to proceed to executive session to consider calendar number 647, Jerome Powell of Maryland to be a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Without objection, the clerk will report the nomination. Nomination, Federal Reserve System. Jerome H. Powell of Maryland to be a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. I sent a cloture motion to the desk with respect to that nomination. The clerk will report the motion. Cloture motion. We, the undersigned senators, in accordance with the provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, hereby move to bring to a close the debate on the nomination of Jerome H. Powell of Maryland to be a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, signed by 18 senators Mr. as President, follows. Mr. President, I ask consent the reading of the names to be waived. Without objection. I ask consent to waive the mandatory quorum required under Rule 22 for both cloture motions. Without objection. Okay. Mr. President, I want to express my appreciation for the good work done on this most important bill that just passed the Senate, the XM Bank. It was reported out of the Banking Committee, and Senator Johnson did a great job with this committee. In addition to that, the work of Senator Cantwell was exemplary. She is a terrific legislator. She gets her teeth in something, she won't let it go. 
and she would not let us take our eye off the prize, that is, passing this important legislation. I have such admiration for her legislative skills, and basically her legislative skills, and uh, this time spread across the record my admiration and uh, congratulate her on this legislation which meant so much to her and the entire country. Mr. President, the National Flood Insurance Program is set to expire at the end of May this month. This program provides insurance coverage for almost six million people who live and work in zones that are flood, flood zones. The National Flood Insurance Program is self-sustaining. For more than 40 years, it's guarded American homeowners against flood-related disasters. If the program expires, new housing constructions will stall, real estate transactions will come to a halt, and taxpayers will be on the hook for future disasters. We've not been able to bring flood insurance to the floor because we've had a lot of problems with Senate procedure that some believe is abusive that's left us with so little time. And I, as you can see, filed cloture on two nominations for Federal Reserve. We're going to file later on a judge that's been waiting for almost a year. So no one believes that there's enough time to pass Congress and enact a long-term flood insurance bill before the end of this month. So we're in a situation where we have to do another short-term extension simply to keep the program from expiring. And thus, I will seek to pass an extension of this important program now, and therefore I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to consideration of calendar number 366S2344, which is an extension of the National Flood Insurance Program. That bill be read a third time passed, and most reconsider be laid on the table. There be no intervening action or debate. Is there objection? Mr. President. The Senator from Oklahoma. Uh, Mr. President, I object, and I will hold my comments until after the Majority Leader finishes his talk so I can explain my objection. I'm, you, I'm, you'd like for me to go ahead? Yes, I'm anxious. I'd be happy to go ahead. I'm serious, Senator about, from I'm serious about this. I'm anxious to hear okay. it. We've had 13 extensions, short-term extensions, to the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, that's over the past four and a half, five years. There's a bill setting to be brought to the floor, and yet we're going to have a short-term e extension again. This program is not financially sound, and it is not self-sustaining. It runs a $900 million deficit every year. What is the National Flood Insurance Program? Do we need it? Yes. Am I objecting that we need it? No. But the vast majority of the monies that are expended by hardworking Americans go to subsidize the insurance for homeowners who second and vacation homes. Multiple times in the Senate and in the House, both have concurred that this should be taken away, this subsidy, for those in terms of second homes and vacation properties. And so what I would expect, if we're going to do an extension, then we ought to do an extension with something that both bodies have already passed, which includes making those people who have properties eight times the average value of the, the rest of the homes and the flood insurance carry their fair share of their insurance. And so I'm not inclined no matter what happens to the flood insurance program, to allow us to continue to extend. I'd make one other point. We won't have time in December to d fix this with everything else that's coming up. So the time to fix this is now, and I won't object to coming to the five-year uh, reauthorization to the floor. I don't think anybody on our side will as well. Uh, and we should address this, and we could be done with it. Uh, but another short-term extension is not what this country needs. We can't afford losing a another $900 million. Plus, the American taxpayer is on the hook for $1.3 trillion with this program right now. And the average subsidy to the average home, not the vacant, is over $1,000 a year. So I have no objecting, objection to supporting those who actually need our help, who are in flood-prone areas. But those that have the tremendous benefit and the opportunity to have second and third homes 
And I think it's objectionable that we continue to subsidize their purchase of flood insurance. That I object. President, before my friend leaves the, the floor. The majority leader. Thank you. I would hope that we could do a five-year bill. As my colleague knows, the main impediment to the regular functioning of the Senate this year has been the offering of irrelevant amendments. So I'm wondering if I could say through the chair to my friend, the, let's see, junior senator from uh, Oklahoma, as to what kind of an agreement do you think we could get on the number of amendments on something like this? Uh, Mr. President, I would respond to the majority leader through the chair to say I would help him in any way that I could uh, with my side of the aisle to make sure that we had cogent amendments uh, to this bill and also agree to a, a limited number of them since it is important that we reauthorize this program. How many, I say again through the chair to my friend, how many amendments do you think you would need? Uh, one or two. Uh, I appreciate uh, my friend from Oklahoma. Uh, it's something I would like to be able to do, but we have so much to do. We've got the farm bill, we've got cyber security, we've got the FDA bill, and I'm filing cloture on nominations. People have been waiting to, to change their lives. I mean, it's so, I'm so sorry that we can't legislate more, because this is a bill. I, I, have, I have sympathy with my friend from Oklahoma. I don't agree with everything he said, but this is a program that needs to be changed. And I recognize that. <coughs> All we have is that. Well, let me. So I will um, <coughs> continue working with my friend. And maybe there's some way that we can work together to figure out a way to move this forward. It's really hard to... What, what I would suggest is I would be happy to work on my side, because Senator Johnson talked, has talked to me twice today on this legislation, to figure out what amendments my folks want to offer, because they want to offer amendments. And if my friend from Oklahoma would also make a decision on his side, to, as he indicated, cogent amendments, relevant amendments, we could put this in a little package and move to it without my having to file closure and do these amendments. I'd like to do that. So I'll work on my side to find out what amendments there are. And if my friend would do that on Monday or Tuesday, we'll talk about this and see if we can get uh, a very concise agreement to do this important legislation. So, and my friend is not denying that, but um, I think we do have to make some changes in it. I'm happy to move forward on that. I think the House is going to take something up pretty soon. I yield the floor, Mr. President. Senator from Oklahoma. Uh, I'd like, if, if the Senator with New Jersey, New Jersey would give me a, the courtesy of five minutes just to speak as in, in morning business and I'll be through. Um, I appreciate what the majority leader has said and I will work my side of the aisle to see if, uh, if, if a possibility of moving this is, is there and we'll give it my 100% effort between now and next Monday when I see the majority leader to see if we can't do it. Uh, I would make a couple of points. Our nation's in big trouble, and we're not acting like it's in big trouble. And, and it seems that the way we're operating is from crisis to crisis. That's not good for the country. It's not good for the agencies. It's certainly not good for the individuals. And it makes it to where we actually can't do effective legislating. The idea behind the flood insurance program is almost 50 years old. There's nothing wrong with its intent. But we can't afford $900 million a year in subsidies to the very wealthy in this country for their second or vacation homes. And so it is time to, if we're talking about fairness, as the president talks, then it's time to reform this program, whether it's an extension or not, this component of it where there's a fair premium, where we're not subsidizing those that can in fact take care of themselves in this country. 
And whether it's this bill or the farm bill, where we're subsidizing 4% of the farmers with 60% of the crop insurance premium, uh, is this, it's the same issue. And so I look forward to working with Majority Leader, and I will do my part to try to gather uh, up the amendments that might be there and work with our leadership to try to be able to bring this bill to the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank the Senator from New Jersey. President. The Senator from New Jersey. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I rise to speak about uh, the Violence Against Women Act uh, that the Senate passed, but we seem to have a challenge uh, with our colleagues in the House of Representatives. Uh, in my view, violence against any woman is still violence. And apparently my Republican colleagues uh, in the House do not share that view. Republicans in the House have introduced a bill that would not protect all women. Their bill would roll back protections for certain vulnerable populations. It would strip provisions in the Senate bill that protect women from discrimination and abuse, specifically Native American women the LGBT community and for undocumented immigrants. It actually rolls back protections they have under current law. Well, Mr. President, we've seen that violence against women is an epidemic and it plagues all of us, not just some of us. We have fought against it. We have tried to end it. We have established programs and policies at the national and state levels to mitigate it. We have stood with the victims of domestic violence and now we must stand up and reaffirm our outrage. It is, in my mind, a no-brainer, and I am frankly hard-pressed to understand why anyone would stand in the way of denouncing violence against any woman, no matter who they are, no matter what their orientation or citizenship is. I am hard-pressed to understand why anyone would choose to exclude violence against certain women, turn back the clock to a time when such violence was not recognized, was not a national disgrace, and make a distinction when and against whom such violence meets our threshold of, cur of outrage. There can be no such threshold and no such distinction. Violence against any woman is an outrage plain and simple. And so is the message to be that we are willing for some reason that in my mind defies logic to accept violence against certain women? Because that seems to be the message the other body is sending us. Mr. President, I cannot believe that anyone would take such a position. But that's exactly what we would do uh, if we listened to our Republican House colleagues. And that, Mr. President, is completely unacceptable to this senator and should be unacceptable to every member of Congress and every American. If our friends on the other side deny that they are waging a political cultural war against women, then why, Mr. President, are they willing to accept an actual war against certain women by excluding them from protection under the Violence Against Women Act. The reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act doesn't just affect those who are or might become victims of sexual violence or domestic violence, it affects all of us. Nearly one in five women report being the victim of rape or attempted rape. One in six report being stalked. One in four women report having been beaten by their partner. Of those who report being raped, 80% report being raped before the age of 25. The short-term physical and emotional trauma of such an event cannot be overstated. Domestic and sexual violence is an issue that affects us all, and we must be all part of the solution. Since 1994, the Violence Against Women's Act has been the centerpiece in our comprehensive approach to protect and empower women, and it must remain so. Since the passage of VAWA in 1994, there has been enormous positive change. From 1993 to 2010, the rate of intimate partner violence declined 67%. More victims are reporting violence to police, and those reports are resulting in more arrests and prosecutions. VAWA is working, but there are still women who need protection. 
For example, in one day in New Jersey, a survey found that domestic violence programs assisted 1,292 victims. On that same day, New Jersey domestic violence hotlines answered 444 phone calls. So our work on this issue is not yet done. And looking to the merits of the reauthorization, let me highlight for the record several critical changes in the legislation, changes that did not simply extend successful programs, but built upon them. Every reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act has incorporated new understandings and updated knowledge, and this reauthorization was and should be no different. First and foremost, the Senate reauthorization includes additional training for law enforcement, victim services, and courts that increase the focus on high-risk offenders and victims, including connecting high-risk victims with crisis intervention services. I'm sure no one can argue against that. Second, the Senate bill strengthens our, rep our response to sexual assault while increasing the connection to nonprofit groups. Sexual assault coalitions in every state have been indispensable allies. I met with a large roundtable before our uh, debate and discussions here in the Senate, and this bill supports their efforts. It included a 20% set aside in assistance to states for sexual assault programs and included reforms to reduce the unprecedented backlog of rape kits. Now, I've been proud to support funding to reduce this backlog. Just recently, I supported Senator Leahy's effort to fund the Debbie Smith DNA Backlog Grant Program at the current level of $125 million, with at least $90 million directly spent on reducing the DNA backlogs. And I'm happy to say that the Violence Against Women Act will make important strides to reduce the backlog. Most importantly, given the debate on this legislation, this reauthorization recognizes that domestic and sexual violence affects all groups, regardless of their sexual orientation. We included common sense protections against discrimination on race and religion, national origin, sex or disability, because it is quite simply the right thing to do because all violence against women is an outrage to all of us. For the first time, the Senate bill established the fundamental notion that victims cannot be denied services based on gender identity or sexual orientation. We included provisions to protect immigrant victims of violence and Native American victims. In the Senate, the bill passed 68 to 31, with a dozen Republicans voting in support of the final legislation despite Republican attempts to weaken the bill during the Senate's consideration of the legislation. Unfortunately, Republicans of the House are attempting to weaken the bill and do what a minority in the Senate could not. And for the first time in the nearly 20-year history of the Violence Against Women's Act, the House reauthorization doesn't expand protections. In essence, it actually instead eliminates a series of them. In its version, the House sent an undeniable message. If you're Native American, if you're LGBT or undocumented, you uh, do not deserve protection. That is the House message. To start, LGBT victims do not receive the protection they need in the House bill. Professionals in the field specifically requested non-discrimination provisions based upon their direct experiences. Studies on the issue only confirm this need. 45% of LGBT victims were turned away from domestic violence shelters. 55% were denied protective orders. The Senate version ensures all victims, gay or straight, share in the protections of vow. But the House version denies these critical protections to LGBT victims. Under the House legislation, immigrant victims of violence would fare far worse than under current law. Far worse than under current law. Domestic violence advocates uh, tell us that often abusers threaten their significant others with uh, having them be brought to authorities and with the possibility of deportation unless they continue to submit themselves to dangerous and inhumane treatment. 
The Violence Against Women's Act provides a way out. But the House version of that law does away with confidentiality protections for immigrant victims. Studies have shown that victims are most vulnerable immediately before or after they leave the abuser. And VAWA protects these victims with confidentiality when they come forward to seek help. The House version instead creates a cruel possibility that in seeking help, the victim will be exposed and face more abuse. How perverse is that? House Republicans would put burdensome new requirements on immigrant victims and give them less help than they receive under the current law. The abuser often possesses the relevant evidence while the abused faces language barriers, isolation, and limited access to legal representation. In past debates of the Violence Against Women Act, we have had wide bipartisan consensus around protections for these victims because a victim is a victim is a victim. But the House reauthorization ignores this consensus and places an unimaginable burden on self-petitioners. Under the House proposal, the program to protect immigrant victims called the U visa program would be a hollow shell of its former self. The permanent visa would now be temporary, reducing the incentive for immigrants to take the risk and assist law enforcement in identifying the abuser, in identifying the person who may have committed a sexual rape. Of course, proponents claim that these reforms are needed to quote unquote combat fraud in the system. But I have to ask, what fraud? To obtain a U visa in the first place, law enforcement personnel must personally sign off. Is there a suggestion that somehow the law enforcement personnel are engaged in a fraud? There is no evidence of fraud in this program. The simple enforcement technique has proven profoundly effective, yet the House insists on adding additional burdens on a vulnerable population only to fight a non-existent problem. Moreover, allowing these abusers to go free puts more criminals in our community who can then victimize more women in the future. Our whole goal here is to end the abuse and to get the abuser to ultimately uh, face up to their punishment. And instead, we would say, oh no, let the abuser go ahead and continue their abuse and we will subject the victim ultimately to a set of circumstances in which not only will they not come forth and talk about the abuse, we will subject the victim ultimately to facing uh, even greater uh, challenges in their lives. Knowing what is at stake and what it would mean to the many victims of domestic violence and sexual violence, there's no question we must pass final uh, legislation as soon as possible. The debate, Mr. President, should be about one thing and one thing only, protecting victims, all victims and each and every one of these women in these categories are in fact victims. There should be no differentiation and there should be protection for all. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Kansas. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to address the Senate as in morning hour. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, earlier today, uh, I attended a memorial service to honor our nation's law enforcement officers who laid down their lives to protect their fellow citizens. Since 1962, May 15th has stood as a day of remembrance for the many fallen police officers who faithfully served our communities and our nation. They must never be forgotten. This year, 362 names were added to the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial. And among those names were three brave officers from Kansas. Two of these men died in the line of duty many years ago, but we pause today to remember their sacrifice. In 1892, Andrew Balfour of Kiowa County was fulfilling his duties as a local sheriff and pursuing a man who was wanted for theft when he was mortally wounded. Andrew passed away at the young age of 41, leaving behind a wife and six children. 
In 1922, William Bloomfield, a deputy sheriff in, serving in Bourbon County, was, arrest, was arresting a well-known criminal when he was killed during a fierce gun battle. These two men honorably serve by faithfully carrying out their duties. Rather than shirk from danger, police officers pledged to face danger with courage, and that is exactly what these two men did. Just five months ago, Kansans were grieved by the loss of another officer, Sergeant David Ensbrenner of Atchison, Kansas. On December 9, 2001, David joined a fellow officer on a routine call to see a local resident. As they were turning to leave the front step of the home, a person suddenly appeared and opened fire on David without warning. This act of violence was unprovoked and forever robbed the Ensbrenner family of their father and husband and the Atchison community of a loyal public servant. When we lose someone in a community in Kansas, it's not just a name to us. It's somebody we go to church with, somebody we see at our kids' activities at school, somebody we know and care for. That is how Atchison felt about David. In remembering David, Atchison Mayor Alan Rivas said this, he was number one father, number one husband, number one partner to his fellow officers, number one son. Inscribed on the National Law Enforcement Memorial here in Washington are these words. It is not how these officers died that made them heroes, it is how they lived. Police Chief Mike Wilson served alongside David for 24 years and said this about his former colleague and friend. Those words speak directly to David. Those words on the National Law Enforcement Memorial. Those words speak directly to David. How true about our brother. David was dedicated to his family, his fellow law enforcement officers, and his community. He was well known in Atchison and well loved. David attended high school there and served in the Atchison Police Department for 24 years. David was also on the board of trustees of his local church and found great joy in teaching and coaching his daughters on their softball teams. Last December, I witnessed the impact David had on the local community when I attended his memorial service and more than 2,000 people gathered to pay their respects to him. During the service, many moving tributes were read about David and how he lived his life, but one that stood out from among the others was a statement from David's wife, Carrie. She said this about her husband. David was a man of few words. He always tried to keep a simple life. And when I questioned things, he would remind me that it's okay sometimes not to understand. We don't fully understand. We don't understand at all, really, why David's life was taken or why the lives of more than 19,000 officers we remembered today ended so soon. But we want to express our gratitude for their service and dedication to their communities and to our country. During National Police Week, we also remember their families and the loved ones they left behind. May God comfort them in their time of grief and be a source of strength for them. May he also protect all those who continue to serve us today. I want to especially mention David Ensbrenner's wife, Carrie and his three teenage daughters, Avery, Abby, and Celia. I want them to know that we honor the way David lived his life and tell them that we love and care for them today and always. I yield the floor, Mr. President. The, of the, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. The Senator from New Hampshire. Mr. President, are we in a quorum call? We are. I ask that the quorum call be lifted. Without objection. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, I come to the floor today to join my colleague, Senator Menendez, and I thank some of our other colleagues who will be here um, soon to reaffirm a commitment to the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. Um, that act recently passed out of the Senate with a strong bipartisan vote that recognizes our
bipartisan commitment here to end domestic and sexual abuse, stalking, and dating violence. The House of Representatives will soon be taking a vote on their proposed counterpart to the Violence Against Women Act. And I want to address some of the concerns that I have with the bill that is on the floor in the House. What we've seen in this country is that domestic violence has a significant impact on families, on victims. It compromises the very stability of our towns and communities. The Violence Against Women Act provides essential resources for victims and for law enforcement. And I was pleased to see so many of us here in the Senate put politics aside and support this important reauthorization. Unfortunately, the House version of the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act does not provide the same level of protection for victims and it does not include some resources that have specifically been requested by law enforcement. In the House bill, protections are diminished for college students, for lesbian, gay, and transgendered victims, for immigrants, and for Native Americans. The Senate bill strengthens the Violence Against Women Law to provide the Violence Against Women Act to provide more protections to more women and their families. The House bill weakens the law by failing to state that same-sex couples will have equal access to services, by decreasing protections for immigrant victims, and by declining to expand the jurisdiction of tribal courts. One example of some of the changes in the House bill where I think it fails is around the protections that the Senate bill provides to women students on college campuses. The Senate bill provides strong protections that have been omitted in the House bill. The Senate bill includes a provision requiring a university to implement prevention programs teaching all students, male and female, how to help prevent sexual violence and dating violence, including bystander education. The Senate bill also requires a university to make reasonable accommodations for a student who needs to change their living, working, or academic situation as the result of being victimized. For example, if a young woman is a victim of an assault and her attacker lives in her dorm, what the Senate bill would do is require the university to help that young woman find another place to live. Unfortunately, these kinds of protections are not included in the House bill. The Department of Justice recently estimated that 25% of college women will be victims of rape or attempted rape before they graduate within a four-year college period, and that women between the ages of 16 to 24 will experience rape at a rate that's four times higher than the assault rate for all women. There is no doubt that this is a serious problem and the safeguards that we implemented in the Senate bill must be preserved if we're to provide the protections that young women and men in college deserve. When we were working on our reauthorization here in the Senate, I had a chance to meet with case workers at crisis centers and with some of the victims of domestic violence in New Hampshire. I heard from one woman who said that if it hadn't been for that 24-hour hotline and her caseworker at the Bridges Crisis Center in Nashua, she would never have been able to leave her abuser. She was finally able to stand up for herself and end the terrible cycle of abuse because of the Violence Against Women Act. All victims should have equal access to these important resources, and it is imperative that this bill provide that. So I urge my colleagues in the House to insist on these essential components so that we can move forward on this reauthorization and we can protect all of the victims of domestic violence. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. The Senator from Indiana. Mr. President, I rise this evening to 
honor a longtime friend.